الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونصلي ونسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع هداه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي All praises are due to Allah the creator, the cherisher and the sustainer of this universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his noble prophet Muhammad and his descendants and followers and companions, dear respected brothers and sisters. Jazakumullahu khairan for coming to attend the third session in the spiritual purification workshop. This workshop is all about purifying our own selves from arrogance and from pride and when we speak about diseases we speak about symptoms of diseases and we speak about causes of these diseases and we speak about treatment Last time we spoke about the symptoms of the disease. The disease, the spiritual weakness is a disease. Ujb, pride is a disease. Inflated soul, people become inflated. The ego grows up. People be, keep blowing their ego until it inflates and it becomes ready for worship. It's an idol that exists inside each and every one of us. That's why the homework of the first week was to feel the gifts of Allah that we have taken for granted. And the homework was to blind yourself. Whether with the swimming goggles that we, you block with tape or even by tying a piece of cloth around your your eyes but you have to experience the lack of any of the gifts of Allah one of the gifts of Allah is the gift of vision and the second week homework last week's homework was to choose some of your competitors who compete with you if you are salesmen the other salesmen who compete with you in the same store or in the same company if you are a doctor another doctor who competes with you and you make dua for them every single day and secretly you don't tell them that you are doing so you make dua for them in the to be successful in the same field because if you do so, and at first I want to know who did it. Show me your hands. Okay. What did you experience? Can, would like someone uh, would someone would like to share with us his experience quickly? What did you feel? You found it hard. He did it for a couple of days. Actually, he 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 uh, uh, practiced the the uh, the first uh, one three days. This one he found it hard. Hard to make dua for other people who compete with you in the same field. Who found it hard? Who found it hard also as well? Hard. You found it hard. But you did it for how many days? Two days also. How many days? For like five days. But you found it hard also. Huh? It's hard. Brothers, this is very good because they touched. They touched the place of the disease. You now actually uh, diagnosed. It's hard. Those two days or those three, five days are the days when you were able to defeat 
to defeat the feeling inside of you that things are either between you and them. It's either you or them. But it's all about believing that Allah has enough for all of us. Those who believe that Allah is sufficient for all of us, is en has enough for all of us, would do it and would not fear any lack in rizq or in anything. So, yes, this is, this is what is called mujahada. This is called mujahada in nafs. Jihad against oneself. Spiritual jihad. You know, jihad is of three types. Spiritual jihad, which is this. Doing jihad against your own self. To be victorious over your own self. Against your evil inclinations. And against desires. And there is verbal jihad. When you speak against a tyrant. Like the revolution in Egypt now. Against the tyrants. And there is the combative jihad. That you defend your religion and you defend your country by fighting occupiers or fighting aggressors. This is the third type. But the hardest type is the spiritual jihad. The hardest type. And you cannot succeed in your life without defeating your own self. Becoming in control of your own self. We have seen what the mujahideen in, uh, did uh, uh, in Afghanistan after kicking out the Soviets. What happened then? Scandal. They fought each other. Why? Because they were not victorious over their own selves yet. So they were victorious over their enemies physically in the combative jihad, which is easier than being victorious over your own self. So that's, that's what we're doing right now. Last time we spoke about the symptoms. How can I know that I have the disease, the spiritual weakness? Today, we will talk about the root causes. What causes this disease? And then we will... Start, inshallah, talking about the treatment as well, inshallah. So talking about the causes of the spiritual disease. What causes the one self to inflate, the ego to grow up? Number one, al-jahlu billah, being ignorant about Allah. I will mention them quickly, the list, and then we will take one by one. So number one, al-jahlu, ignorance, billah, ignorance about Allah. Second, al-jahlu bin-nafs, being ignorant about your own self. Three, neglecting tarbiyah, when you don't seek purification for your own self, of your own soul. Four, being successful all the time. Frequent cases of success in your life. This causes inflating of the soul. I'm not telling you to be a loser. But I'm, I'm just telling you, these things put you in danger. Being praised all the time. Or being frequently praised by people. Power, authority also causes the soul to be inflated. When you don't have relationship with competent people. So you are always number one everywhere. You are the most competent all the time. Because you don't have relationships with others who are also competent like you. When you don't have people to advise you, you're just all the time finding people coming, seeking your advice. But you don't have people to advise you. This is very dangerous. Wrong terbiya during childhood. Wrong upbringing during the childhood can cause also the inflating of the soul. Weaknesses of personality. Some people have 
weak personalities. They can also cause spiritual disease, spiritual weakness. Fame is also one of them. Let's talk about one by one. Al-Jahlu Billah. The most important, by the way. And Al-Jahlu Billah and Al-Jahlu Bil-Nafs, being ignorant about Allah and being ignorant about oneself, are, are very linked to each other, by the way. Let's talk about Al-Jahlu Billah. Ignorance about Allah. Alhamdulillah. Whoever knows Allah well would definitely know that he himself has nothing to do with any of his talents or capabilities. Everything comes from Allah. But he personally doesn't have anything to do with any successes in his life. Even being devout and religious even your fasting, even your prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, We, it's in the Quran in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 73, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We inspired them to do good work, to keep up the prayer, and to give the alms the zakah allah is the one here there's a there's a question why allah speaks about himself and says we how many gods do we have one why does he say we this is called the royal we when a king speaks he says we the king of belgium are opening the museum allah is the king of the kings and he is the only one actually who should speak with a we about himself but this is called linguistically the royal we. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks that he is the one who inspires people to pray. Inspires you to recite Quran. Inspires you to fast. So even your good deeds, you refer it to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ibadi, innama hiya a'amalukum uhsiha alaykum. Uhsiha alaykum. My servants, I am recording your deeds. Then I will reward you. So the one who finds reward, let him be thankful. And the one who doesn't find reward should only blame himself. So you do good deeds, Allah will reward you. When you get the reward, thank Allah. Don't thank yourself. Why? I am the one who did the deeds. It's exactly as if I invite you to a banquet. I go and I buy food and you eat the food. After you eat, you, you will thank yourself because you, eat, you ate. No, you will thank me because I bought the food. So Allah actually is the one who we should refer all the good to him. He is the source of all the good in the world. And this applies on all human beings, including the prophets, and including Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him in the Quran, وَلَئِنْ شِئْنَا لَنَذْهَبَنَّ بِالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ ثُمَّ لَا تَجْدُ لَكَ بِهِ عَلَيْنَا وَكِيلًا إِلَّا رَحْمَةً مِنْ رَبِّكَ Allah says to the Prophet, we had, if we had wished, we could take away what we have revealed to you. The Quran. Allah speaks here to Prophet Muhammad about the Quran. If I wish, I can take away the Quran from you. If we had wished, we could take away what we have revealed to you. Then you would find no one to plead for you against us. If it were not for your Lord's mercy, his favor to you has been truly great. It is by the grace of Allah that we pray and we fast and we pay zakah. It's by the grace of Allah. It's by the grace of Allah that Prophet Muhammad became a prophet. It's not his own talents or capabilities. He was talented, he was here, yeah, but it's not about him personally that made him. A prophet. It's the grace of Allah that made him a prophet. 
is the great by the grace of Allah he received the Quran. You cannot uh, practice Islam and become very devout until you become a prophet. No, Allah has to choose you to become a prophet. Of course, no more prophets. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm telling you, even people uh, before Prophet Muhammad, they cannot do purification for themselves until they become prophets. No, Allah chooses people to become prophets by the grace of Allah. What was the nasheed that the Sahaba were singing when they were digging the trench? Who knows the nasheed? Hmm. Allahumma lawla anta mahtadayna wa la tasaddaqna wa la sallayna It means, O oh Allah, without your grace we could have never been guided nor we could have prayed, nor we could have been paid charity. This is what they sing. Reminding themselves, purifying their souls, that everything good that they do is, is, comes from Allah. So they say, Oh Allah, when they are digging the trench, Oh Allah, without your guidance, we could have never been guided or prayed or even paid zakat. The second cause is al-jahlu bin nafs, ignorance about oneself, the nature of your own self. We said there are two types of desires, apparent desires and hidden desires. The apparent desires is like eating, drinking, sexual activities, stuff like that. And Allah spoke about them in the Quran, said, Zuyina lin nasi hubbu shahawati min an nisa iwal banina wal kanatiri al mukantarati min al dhahabi wal fiddati wal khayli al musawamati wal an ami wal harf. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, verse number 14, The love of desirable things is made alluring for men, women, children, gold and silver, treasures piled up high, horses with fine markings, livestock and farmland. These may be the joys of this life, but God has the best place to return to. So these are the apparent desires. There are also hidden desires. And we spoke last time about the worst. The biggest human desire is to feel distinguished from others. To be looked at highly, higher than others. So love of being distinguished, love of being looked at higher than others, love of being pointed at wherever you go, or being famous. These are hidden desires. You feel like sometimes you're, you tell people, you know what, today people in my work told me you are the best one to do so and so. You're, you're, you're happy because they told you you're the best. You're proud that they told you you are the best. You are the most who can do so and so. Praise. Praise is khamr in nafs. The wine of the soul. It is the alcohol of the soul. You feel proud of being rich, for example. When you're proud of being rich, this means that you don't understand your own self. You think that the money in your bank account or the money in your wallet belongs to you. So you don't really understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتُوهُمْ مِن مَالِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي آتَاكُمْ Speaking about slaves, he says, give them out of the wealth of Allah that he gave to you in order to buy their own freedom. So he says, give them out of the money of Allah that he gave to you. So the money that you have is not yours. And I gave this example before. It's like when you have an account in the bank and you can have a credit card or a, a debit card. So you can issue a supplementary card for someone else who is not the owner of the money, but you are allowing maybe your wife or your children, one of your children, to use your money. That's exactly the example. For Allah is the highest example. Allah is allowing us to use his money. To test us. He said in Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf. We read it every single week. Why? Because there are meanings that should be renewed in the heart of a Muslim. At least every week. One of them is this. 
إنا جعلنا ما على الأرض زينة لها لنبلوهم أيهم أحسن عملا We have made all the joys on earth as beautiful and ornaments for this earth in order to test them who will do righteous deeds so Allah is testing you with this money when you think yourself rich and you forgot that it is his money you really want to know how much you have belongs to you look at yourself entering your grave what will you take with you you are wrapped in two pieces of cloth that have no pockets because you won't take anything with you in the kafan there is no pockets but you won't take any cash with you cash is not accepted there credit cards they expire as soon as you die checks are not accepted there the only accepted is money wire transfer in this life you transfer money to your account with Allah and here when you transfer money from a bank to the other bank or maybe international if you transfer like 1000 pounds they reach there 985 why it's transaction fees with Allah there is no transaction fees if you transfer 1000 they are there at least 10,000 and Allah multiplies up to 700 and Allah multiplies even more than that but you need to do that now because you know when you do this when you feel that the money is his you're just returning the money to him so this is the problem you think you, you get you become proud of your possessions proud of your car proud of your house proud of your things that you possess you don't possess anything it's Allah who's allowing you to use these things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah Saba, verse number 22 قُلِ ادْعُوا الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَلَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Say, pray to your so-called gods besides, God, besides Allah. They do not have even the weight of a speck of dust in heaven or earth. Nor do they have any share in them. No one has anything. No one. And when you read the Quran to find the human being, what the Quran says about the human being, you will find that he is nothing without Allah. Without Allah, we are all unplugged. We are powerless. We are the poorest. Actually, this Hajj, last Hajj, I made Hajj last year. Actually, I made Hajj for one of the Shuhada of Rabah, one of the martyrs in Rabah. Uh, it was the sixth time that I make Hajj, by the way. All the five times before, I was thinking or looking at what's happening in Hajj like we are uh, acting because we take off our clothes and we wear special clothes to act as if we are all equal and to act as if we are all poor and as if we are all helpless last year i understood that it's exactly the opposite hajj is the truth because it's true that we are all poor and we are all helpless and we are all weak outside hajj we are acting this one is acting as if he's rich this one is acting as if he's strong this one is acting as if he is powerful that's why we need to think a lot about the ibadat that we do. Pride, according to Al-Harith Al-Muhasabi, one of the great scholars, he said, Al-Ujbu, pride, huwa hamdu nafs ala ma amilat aw alimat wa nisyanu anna ni'ami min Allah azza wa jal. He said, Pride is praising oneself when you praise yourself for what you did or for what you know, forgetting that both come from Allah, whether you deeds 
or your knowledge, they come from Allah. So don't praise yourself. Pride is when you praise yourself for what you did or for what you know. And he said also that pride is a malignant disease that makes one look highly at his own sayings or work or knowledge or opinions and praises himself for them. He's explaining. The third cause of spiritual weakness is neglecting self-purification. And the ulama said that among the reasons of an inflated soul, inflated ego, is not paying attention to the disease in the beginnings. So the disease in the beginning can be treated quickly, can be treated easier than if you neglect it until it becomes, uh, until it overcomes you. And because of you, of your, when you are not protecting yourself against the disease. Therefore, a knowledge seeker, and we are all knowledge seekers. You came here to seek knowledge, right? A knowledge seeker should pay attention to this and learn how to deal with his own soul in the very beginning of the disease or else knowledge itself will become a gateway for pride same for a professor or a writer or a public speaker or anyone who does good community service work. So knowledge itself can be, can harm you if you don't take care of spiritual purification. Because when you become knowledgeable every day, you start speaking about yourself, speaking about your knowledge, looking highly at your own self because you read 500 books or because you had three, four PhDs, you start thinking about yourself as a knowledgeable person, forgetting from where this knowledge came, from where, forgetting who gave you this knowledge. So always remind yourself, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sharri nafsi. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the evil of my own self. Always make this dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sharri nafsi. And when people praise you, when people praise you, say, Allahumma aghfir li ma la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive me for what they don't know about me. If people know your, your reality, they won't praise you. They only know the good things about you. So they praise you. Or they're flattering you. So always seek refuge with Allah from the evil of your own self. And always ask Allah forgiveness for what people don't know. This means that you are reminding yourself that you are a sinner of your sins, of your shortcomings. You have to remind yourself. Number four, kathratun najahat, being frequently successful. Here, Al-Hasan al-Basri says, had everything the son of Adam did or said or said is right, he could have gone crazy. Because, and this is really what happens when, when most of what you're doing is right and you're always successful, you say an opinion, it turns out that you had the right opinion. You do something, it turns out that you're the best one who's doing this. So you are successful all the time. This can make you crazy. Really. It's very hard when you are admired and loved by people for being funny, for being nice, for being easygoing, for being knowledgeable, for being helpful, for, and people love you everywhere and people look at you highly. It's very hard not to fall into spiritual disease. I'm not telling you to be rude with people. This is not the treatment was coming next. We will talk about the treatment. But here I'm telling you, it's, it's very, uh, very dangerous being successful all the time, which is good. And I want you to be successful all the time. But be careful that these things can put you in danger. So there are other things that you need to do. 
being frequently praised. Um, a man praised another man in the presence of the Prophet. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Oh, you have slain your brother. Had he heard this, he would never be successful. So the man wasn't even present. He wasn't there. But the man just praised him. Praise is dangerous. Because if he hears his praise, or if he hears that someone is praising him, he will believe it. And if he believes it, he will be proud of himself. And when he's proud of himself, his soul will inflate. The ego will grow. And when the ego grows, he will feel higher than others. And when he feels higher than others, this will decrease the importance of good deeds. When people start to feel higher than others, the importance of good deeds start to decrease in their eyes because Khalas, I don't need to make a lot of good deeds like before. And at the same time, people start to forget their shortcomings and to forget their bad deeds. And of course, they bec when, when you reach this, Billah, you become arrogant. And when you become arrogant, you destroyed yourself. So it starts by people praising you, it ends up destroying yourself. Al Mawardi said, one of the biggest causes of pride is praise and flattering. Authority. Authority also causes spiritual diseases. Any person in authority will find space to move without objection from others, without interruption from anyone. He will always find pe more people to praise him. The more the authorities you have, the more people praising you. And rarely when you are criticized. And the more your power, the less people to criticize you. And all this allows pr pride to infiltrate into your soul. Who was like that? And Namrud. Namrud, the king at the time of Prophet Ibrahim. If an Namrud was poor or was uh, not famous among people or was not powerful, he could have never claimed that he is God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about him in Surah Al-Baqarah. Verse number 258. Have you not thought about the man who disputed with Abraham about his Lord because God had given him power to rule? So the power to rule led him to his own destruction. According to the Quran, the cause is his power to rule. Seven, when you don't have enough competent people around you, so you are always the most competent. Always people look at you like the, you are the best, you are number one, who have the best opinions, who does the best things. This is very dangerous too. Eight, when you don't have people to advise you, you're just... Someone that people come and seek advice, but who, who do you seek advice from? You don't have people to advise you. Advice and criticism have a big role in putting oneself in its real size, real rank, real position. Omar used to encourage people to advise him and make dua and say, Rahim Allahu imra'an. May Allah be merciful to the one who will give me a gift by telling me my shortcomings. So he considered uh, admonishing 
and advising about his own shortcoming, he considers it a gift. And he said, may Allah be merciful to the one who will give me my tell me my shortcomings as if he's giving me a gift. Encouraging people to criticize. I told you last time, Sheikh Ali Tantawi used to sit and bring his own children, grandchildren, and bring a paper and a pen and tell them, hmm, who will tell me my shortcomings? They say, what? He says, yes, I want you to tell me my shortcomings. I want to write them down and I want to deal with them in order to be a better person. So all of them grew up and they said, we had a, yani, an ego that is not inflated and, and doesn't, we don't become angry when people advise us or criticize us. This leads us to talk about quality disciplining during childhood. And we said last time, don't praise your children, encourage them. Don't praise them, encourage them. When, when a child does something good, don't tell them, wow, you became the best one to do so. And they don't say so. Say, wow, you are doing it better than before. I want you to keep becoming better and better every day. And I want you to learn even more things. But don't, don't flatter them. Don't praise them. Don't help them grow an ego in a very young age. And teach them that doing mistakes is one of the aspects of being human. Prophet Muhammad Anas said, I served the Prophet for about nine years. He never ever told me, why did you do this or why did you do that? Do you think that Anas never made mistakes? He made mistakes. But be, doing a mistake is one aspect of being human. Don't punish them. Don't praise them. Just tell them to learn from the mistakes. Tell them to learn from the mistakes. But we keep telling them, hey, you became the strongest boy. So he's like very happy because he became the strongest boy. You're the most beautiful girl. She's very happy because she's the most beautiful girl. And then they go to school and go to university and they discover that they are not the most strong and they are not the most beautiful. And they get frustrated. Because you grew the ego in their childhood. Don't do that. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. When he's disciplining a child. He tells him, Ya Ghulam, young man, Inni u'allimuka kalimat. I will teach you some words. Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Ihfadillaha yahfadhk. Be mindful of Allah, Allah will protect you. So he is planting in him the feeling that the protection comes from Allah alone. Be mindful of Allah and you will find him in front of you. He means close to you. Be mindful of Allah and he will become close to you. If you ask then only ask Allah alone. He's teaching the child not to ask except Allah. Because only Allah has. People don't have. And if you seek help, then seek help from Allah alone. And know that if the nation were to gather together to benefit you with anything, they would not benefit you except with what Allah had already prescribed to, for you. And if the nation were to gather together to harm you with anything, they would not harm you except with what Allah had already prescribed against you. The pens are lifted and the pages are dry, which means full stop. This is teaching a child. Putting the right aqidah in him. That benefit comes from Allah. Nothing comes without the permission of Allah. Even harm, if not with the permission of Allah, it will not happen to you. Don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of anything. Only Allah. Be mindful of Allah. Ten. Personality weaknesses. Some people have weak personality. And sometimes have some weaknesses in the surrounding environment. How they grew up, 
maybe some weaknesses in the family, some things like that. So they try to hide these weaknesses by acting arrogantly. Some people who act arrogantly, it's not really that they are successful. It's not really that they are have anything good, but some of them, they just try to compensate these weak personalities that they have. So they do the opposite. They act arrogantly. Incompetent people, and this is what one of the scholars called Ibn al-Mu'taz said. He said, when incompetent people who know that they lack things and know their deficiencies resort to pride and arrogance to magnify their insignificant selves. So their own selves are insignificant. So they try to magnify themselves and raise their lowly selves. Still, it doesn't help and it doesn't do anything for them. They just look like idiots. And people look at them like idiots. Someone who's trying to uh, yani be arrogant and to uh, look like a rich person while we all know that he's not rich. So people look at them as, as idiots. So it's not only that yani, he is not rich and arrogant. No, he is poor and arrogant. So they look, someone who's ignorant and he tries to make himself a alim or a knowledgeable person. People, he looks like an idiot. People know that he's ignorant and that most of what he's saying is wrong. But he tries to magnify himself. So this is also uh, one of the problems. 11. Fame. When people become famous, they are in danger. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, كَفَى بِالْمَرْءِ فِتْنَةً أَنْ يُشَارَ إِلَيْهِ بِالْأَصَابِعَ He said, it is so dangerous when one becomes famous and pointed at wherever he goes. <coughs> That's why uh, some uh, Salaf, some, uh, uh, Salaf means the old generation. It means the first three generations who are the best generations. The Sahaba, companions of the Prophet Sallallahu and at tabi'in which means the students of the Sahaba. And tabi'i tabi'in the students of the students of the Sahaba. They said, the listeners, when someone is speaking, listeners are receiving mercy, while the speaker receives fitna. This chair is dangerous. When you sit and you speak to people, they are receiving mercy and you may be receiving fitna. Can't imagine. It's even a fitna greater than the fitna of women. Greater than the fitna of money. It is the fitna of being looked at highly. People don't know except what yeah, you look like. Uh, but they don't know the truth. If they know the truth, they won't even listen to you. If you know the truth about me, you won't even sit and listen to me, by the way. Fitna. Fitna. He speaks and they listen. He makes dua and they say ameen. Fitna. That's why someone told uh, Umar ibn Khattab that my tribe wants me to lead the prayers and they want me to preach. To give them lessons. Omar said no. Just lead the prayers. But don't speak to them. I'm afraid that you speak to them. And you start inflating. Until you think that you can reach the sky. Omar can know people. Can know men. And Omar ibn Khattab actually. Was the one of the best examples of spiritual purification. In the coming uh, uh, lessons inshallah we will speak about how Omar used to deal with his own self when he's when he woke up one day and his uh, his self told him wow you are the Amir al -Mu'mini. he dealt with it I'll tell you later inshallah how he dealt with it Omar actually removed Khalid ibn al-Walid who was a very successful military commander because he was afraid 
that pride would jump into his heart. He was afraid. He loved Khalid. He loved him so much. And he was afraid when he saw him successful here and there. He's never defeated anywhere. He's always genius military commander. He said, Abu Bakr, remove him. Abu Bakr said, no, I'm not going to put a sword back in, its, in its place where Allah uh, yeah, he took it and, and, uh, and fought with it against Kufar. Umar was afraid that Khalid would, 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 uh, would have the spiritual disease. So he did so to Khalid because of that. And Umar, by the way, before he dies, he said, رحم الله أبا بكر لقد كان أعلم مني بالرجال لو استقبلت من أمري ما استدبرت ما عزلت خالدا May Allah be merciful to Abu Bakr He knew men more than I If time goes back I would have never done that to Khalid So when he did it to Khalid He did it because he was afraid That Khalid himself would suffer From spiritual or from pride or... It's hard when you become in the spotlight you may believe that you are really great. And believing that you are great is a very fertile soil for the growth of the ego. And then your ego inflates. So the idol that you are blowing and it's inflating becomes ready for worship when you think yourself great. Like that, we spoke about the causes. Let's now speak about the treatment. How can we deal with these, with the spiritual disease? How can we deal with these idols that we have inside ourselves? Number one, number one, ask Allah to help you and to cure you. Second, learn the truth about Allah. Third, learn the truth about yourself. And your own nature. Four. Exaggerate in humbling yourself. To others. To your brothers and sisters. Five. Close the gateways of pride. Six. Treatment using the Quran. I'm expecting those who attended with us. At Tarbiya al-Imaniya. To be reading the Quran. For about an hour every day. Okay. Um, that's what I'm expecting. That we continue. Discipline yourself. What does it mean? By removing these idols, destroying the idols. It's by seeing yourself small. No matter how people look at you. People may look at you as a great person. You have to look at yourself as a small person. Do the good deed, but don't be satisfied with the good that you do. Always feel that it's not enough. It's not enough. That's why when you deprived yourself from some of the gifts of Allah, like the vision, you have to feel like all the good deeds that you do are not enough to thank Allah for these gifts. Don't think yourself better than others. Actually think that others are better than you. Let me show you an example from the Quran about people who are like that. Allah says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَتَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ أَمَنُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ أَمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرُهْبَانًا وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ Here Allah speaks about a special type of Christians because some people think that Allah speaks here about Christians. That's not true. Here Allah speaks about the true followers of Jesus who rejected the Trinity and rejected the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the deification of Jesus. What people look at Jesus as, a, as divine. He said, you are sure to find the closest in affection towards the believers are those who say, we are Christians, for there are among them priests and monks. These people are never arrogant. So Allah spoke about them that what is significant about them that they are never arrogant. 
And when they listen to what has been sent down to the messenger, you will see their eyes overflowing with tears because they recognize the truth. They say, Our Lord, we believe, so count us among the witnesses. Why should we not believe in God and in the truth that has come down to us when we long for our Lord to allow us in the company of the righteous? We hope that God allows us to be in the company of the righteous. So on the day of judgment, they want to be in the company of the righteous people. Do you know what does that mean? They look at themselves so small that they know that they cannot be righteous. They just hope that Allah makes them with the righteous people. So humble, so down to earth. They don't even wish to be righteous. All they hope is to be in Jannah with the righteous. They know that they are so bad. That's what they think about themselves. So what is their reality before Allah? How Allah looks at them? فَأَثَابَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِمَا قَالُوا جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْمُحْسِنِينَ for saying this, God has rewarded them with gardens, graced with flowing streams, and there they will stay. That is the reward of those who practice Ihsan. Al-Muhsinin, those who practice Ihsan. It is Islam, Iman, Ihsan. The highest is Ihsan. So actually their reality is that they are the best. How they look at themselves, they look at themselves as the worst. Humble people, humble people. The more humble you are, the more great you are in the sight of Allah. Before Allah, you are high. When you look at yourself, low. What does it mean to destroy these idols? Idols inside us. Always remember that Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar means Allah is greater. Not Allah is great. Not Allah is the greatest. I don't know why translators translate it like that. Allahu Akbar means Allah is greater. And when I spoke to translators, they said, because it, it's an incomplete sentence. Allah is greater than the, the people will say, okay, greater than what? So I tell them it's, it's the same in Arabic. Same in Arabic, just translate as it is. Yes, Allahu Akbar is an incomplete sentence. That's true. But a situation would complete it. So in war, you say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than this enemy. In salah, you say, Allahu Akbar, greater than the shaitan who is trying to distract you. Allahu Akbar, than these worldly pleasures that are trying to distract you. So you say, Allahu, always remember that Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater, greater than you, greater than your talents, than your capabilities, than everything. And that all what you have, always remember that all what you have, and all the success comes from him alone. If he just leaves you for yourself, for your own talents, for like a second, only a wink of an eye, you will fail. That's why that was the dua of Prophet Muhammad. Allahumma la takilna ila anfusina tarfata aynin wa la aqalla min dhalik. Oh Allah, don't let me be alone with my own self or talent for a wink of an eye or even less than that. We have to know that the treatment is difficult. Yeah, I'm telling you, this is the most dangerous disease. Pride. Having a, an inflated ego. The, the, the treatment is very difficult. Very difficult. But nothing is difficult for Allah. So you always have to seek the cure from Allah. You always have to, since you know that it's hard. You see, the guys couldn't make dua except for two days. Dua for people. Two days. What? It's difficult. It's, it's, all of us have fallen, have fallen into this disease. Seek the help of Allah. Seek the cure from Allah. 
But you need to know that this homework that we give is difficult. It's like exactly a bitter medicine. You have to struggle with the bitterness of the medicine sometimes. You have to struggle with the bitterness of the medicine in order to be cured. So you have to. You have to do that for yourself. The Sahaba did that to themselves, by the way. Omar, at the day of Eid, when he woke up and his own self told him that you are the Amir of Mu'mineen, he went barefoot on the day of Eid. He went on the member wearing uh, yani rugs and he said, I remember when I was young and I used to uh, take care of some few goats that belonged to my aunts and in return they would just pay me a handful of dates. It's like he's saying that I used to work in a very... And that's what he said. So when he was the Khalifa, he was ruling nearly one third of the known world at that time. Persia started to collapse at the time of Omar, Persia and the Roman Byzantines. And he went out, did that to himself. Because you know that his self can destroy him. His ego can destroy him. You have to make use of your sins. Make use of them to return back to Allah. You can return back to Allah through your sins. When you do a sin and you remember and you cry. And when you every time, even after 10 years, you put your, your, your head on the floor when you are in sujood. And you say, oh Allah, I'm a criminal. I'm a sinner. Help me. Forgive me. Ibn Atayullah Sakandari said, Rubba ma'asiyatin, aw rathat dhullan wa nkisaran, khayrun min ta'atin, aw rathat dhullan, aw rathat ujban wa stikbaran. Maybe a sin that would make you feel humiliated and humble yourself to Allah is much better than a good deed that would make you proud of yourself and make you arrogant. Try to understand why Allah does sometimes things that look bad for you. Sometimes Allah may, 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 yeah, you may sometimes be in trouble. Sometimes Allah does that for you. Try to find the, the wisdom of Allah behind the accidents that happen to you. It is to make you feel that you are weak. This is good for you, by the way. You are weak. That's why I'm telling you. Diarrhea is something good. It reminds you of your weakness. Look at this great man, very respectable person, when he's having diarrhea. And he runs every minute to the bathroom. And if someone is in the bathroom, he keeps knocking the door. Where is the respect? Alas, diarrhea. I'm telling you, yes. So Allah sometimes puts you in these situations to remind you, you are weak. Allah says in the Quran, وَبَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيِّئَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ We tested them with blessings and misfortunes so that they might all return. Return to Allah. And Ibn Atayullah said, إذا رزقت الفهم في المنع صار المنع عين العطاء. If you are granted understanding why he deprived you, deprivation would be the biggest gift of Allah. If Allah grants you the understanding why he is depriving you, this deprivation in itself is a gift from Allah. But try to think why. Uh, Accompany competent people. Don't be only among people who look at you highly. Be with other competent people who are as good as you in doing things, who are wise, wiser than you also. Like that, you learn from them and you always feel like you're not the best. There are others who are much better. Uh, I have a, a student who was like number one in, the, in her school. People look at her like the genius. And then she came to study in UCL. She found herself normal with others who are looked at like a genius. Everyone in his school. And then all of them together, 
she understood that, oh no, there are others who are like me and even better. So a company also uh, successful people. So if Allah puts in your, in your way people who are better than you, this is good, in order to feel your weakness and to, feel, to know your real rank and your real position. And Allah makes you feel not favored above others. This is good. This is a treatment from Allah. When he makes you feel like you're not favored above others. He's not favoring you above others. When sometimes you make dua and he doesn't respond to you. So don't think that you are like a saint. You became one of the awliya Allah salihin. No, no, no. I'm not going to respond to your prayer. It's a treatment from Allah. Sometimes he's doing this for your own sake also by making you fall in problems by depriving you success sometimes it's all for your own benefit sometimes allah means that you don't become famous makes you not in the spotlights because fame is fitna and uh, being praised by people is fitna. So you should also stay away as much as possible from fame. From becoming famous. Stay as much as possible from that. If you can help in the background. Help from the background. You can do community work, community volunteering. But not be on the stage speaking. This is better for you. By the way. Not necessarily that the imam... Or the khatib is the best one in the mosque. No, no, he, can, he may be the worst before Allah. He may be the worst. He is, he is in a place where he is receiving fitna. Make dua for the imams. Make dua for the public speakers. Make dua for them. Sometimes Allah also makes you or belittle your work. Belittle. Allah belittles your work. Dawood السلام, said, Oh Allah, Dawood used to stay all night praying and making dhikr all night. And then he made dua at Fajr, said, Oh Allah. Did anyone this night stay longer than me making dhikr for you? Allah told him, yes, the frogs. They kept doing wah, 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 wah all night long. <laughs> He's treating the wood. Hey, hey, hey. I'm the one who inspired you to do dhikr for me. Don't be proud of yourself. Can you imagine this? Yeah, the frogs. Uh, forgetting good deeds. Allah makes you forget good deeds. It's for your own benefit. Can you imagine that if you if you remember all the good deeds that you did in your life? Oh, this is so dangerous. So one of his gifts, he makes you forget the good deeds. And you should also try also to forget the good deeds. Don't remember the good deeds. And don't worry, they are all recorded. Don't worry. Don't record them. They are recorded. Delaying help. Sometimes you seek help and it's delayed. It is to discover your real rank before Allah. Your servant, your weak, and your helpless. And Allah wants you to stay like that, to remember that you're weak, you're helpless. Keep asking Allah. Keep asking Allah. But the help can be delayed. He knows when. He knows when. Don't think that you know more than the doctor who's treating you. Allah knows when. And for Allah is the highest example, of course. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْعَذَابِ فَمَا اسْتَكَانُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَمَا يَتَضَرَّعُونَ We have already afflicted them so that they may submit to their Lord, they may humble themselves. So Allah actually sometimes afflicts you with or puts you in trouble or in some problems 
in order to submit to him and to return back to him, to humble yourself to him. And this makes you feel in need of your Lord. So you worship him more and you beg him. For example, Prophet Muhammad was put in a very embarrassing situation. Three kuffar went to him. Actually, they went to the Jews. They said, look, you Jews are the people of the book. You have more knowledge than us. Tell us some questions that we can go and ask Muhammad and prove to his followers that he is an imposter, that he's a liar. They said, look, go and ask him three questions about this, this, and that. If he answers, then he is a prophet. So the kuffar went and said, Muhammad, tell us. If you are really a prophet, answer these questions. And they asked him the three questions. The prophet told them, the prophet doesn't speak out of his own self. The prophet always waits for uh, inspiration. He said, I'll tell you tomorrow. And he just forgot to say, inshallah. Every single day they come. No answer. Very embarrassing situation. Very embarrassing situation. Here, the hadith itself says, uh, they said, Muhammad promised us tomorrow, and today is the 15th day. And he is not telling us anything about what we have asked. And the hadith says, until the Prophet became sad, became saddened with this. It's very embarrassing. And he, be, he felt يعني, so bad what the people of Mecca are saying about him. And then Jibreel came down with Surah Al-Kaf, telling him the answers and telling him, don't you ever say again, I'll do this or I'll do that tomorrow, except after saying, inshallah. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَيَّ شَاءَ اللَّهِ So even the Prophet ﷺ actually, the next session is a very important one. And it is about how Allah disciplined Prophet Muhammad ﷺ spiritually. It is something that people from outside this workshop may think that we are not speaking with respect about Prophet Muhammad. So don't invite people from outside this workshop to come next time. They won't understand the context. It is a very interesting one. And you will be shocked, shocked how Allah disciplined the Prophet ﷺ. So even Prophet Muhammad himself also received very hard. Actually, the disciplining, the disciplining that he received, none of us can bear one over 1,000 of it. None of us can bear it. And you will see next time. You will lie. You will feel that you love him so much more than any other time when you see what he uh, received from Allah to be that good. Now let's speak about our homework. I want you to look about or to look for people who are less than you or maybe poorer than you or maybe employees who work for you. And you ask them advice. Don't ask advice from anyone. Because actually, it's okay to go to someone higher or more knowledgeable or in a higher position and you ask his advice. This is normal. This can be even a way to flatter, by the way. No. Try to do that with someone who is poor. Ask advice of people who are less than you. Less fortunate, I mean. No one knows who is better than who. But I'm seeing less fortunate in this life. Maybe poorer, maybe uh, younger uh, employees who work for you. And ask them about tell some advice. Tell them, advise me. What, what do you think is wrong with me? Give me my shortcomings. Can, can you do so? Of course, I know that you will find it a way to... Uh, yeah, any, uh, uh, discipline your children, and you will do that with your children, like Sheikh Ali Tontau. But no, I want to. I also want you to do that, <coughs> maybe with one of your neighbors or something like. That. I want you to do that. Try. It's hard to seek advice from people, but don't ask your wife, because she's now listening to this, preparing a list. She say, 
Father Solomon said, I will advise you. Did, 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 did. No, of course you can. But I mean people who are less fortunate. That's what I mean. I mean, maybe like poorer people or something. This is not. Um, think about your own shortcomings. We we thought and we recorded and uh, we, we listed the uh, list of the ni'am, the gifts of Allah. Try to do your shortcomings. What what do you lack? Try to write a list. So I want you to write a list of what you lack. What do you lack? Write them down. Actually, uh, in, in, in winter, it's easier to give this homework, which is we fast about three days every week. But these days, I know that it's becoming very hard. I'm not going to do that to you, Yanni. It will be only one day. Only one day that you fast secretly. And I mean secretly, I mean that no one will know. And if anyone knows, even before Maghrib, 15 minutes before Maghrib, you will take a glass of water and you will spoil your fasting. And next day you will fast again in order to learn how to do things secretly between you and Allah. Of course I know that women should take permission from their husbands in uh, this means that if the uh, because of the sexual relationship this is yani if but i'm telling you yeah, there are cases of course where some people may yani but i mean don't let people around you know so i want you to to fast on actually shaban started today and in shaban the prophet used to fast a lot so we will fast only one day during the week. Khalas? But make sure no one knows. No one knows. Hide it. Without, without uh, uh, telling a lie. Without lying. Say, I can't. I don't want. I can't. Khalas? But don't say I'm fasting. I don't say I ate outside. So this is a lie. Okay? But you can say maybe I ate before. You ate before. But anyway, make sure that no one knows. And if anyone knows, you will drink. Next day, you will fast again. Or choose another day during the week. This is hard, I know, especially these days. But this can, يعني, one of the things that Ali ibn Abi Talib said, that the most three things that he loves is الصيف, which is fasting during summer, when it's hard. Because like that, he's showing Allah that he's, he's sacrificing for him. You're doing this for the sake of Allah, inshallah. Okay? Jazakumullah khairan wa barakallah fikum. Please make dua for me as a, one of your brothers. And I will make for dua for you as well, inshallah, that Allah helps us through these workshops attain the spiritual purification that we all seek. Jazakumullah khairan. If, if, if anyone has a question, I, I welcome the questions. But you're dismissed. If anyone wants to go, you can go. Yes, yeah. Sure. Do that. No, no, no. In the workplace, sometimes you need to show that you are confident. That you have to do that. But don't think inside that this is because you are good. Always, you know that. Even when you do this, Allah is helping you to do that. And actually, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, before the battle of, think Badr or Uhud. Don't remember. Who will take my sword, his own sword, and fight with it? But there is one condition, that he keeps fighting with it until it gets broken. It means you will never put it down, back. It means you keep fighting all the time and you don't rest. So none of the Sahaba took it. Because all of them, they need rest sometimes. Except one, I think Abu Dujana or al qaqa He took it and he walked with it like that. Proud that he took the sword of the Prophet, but in a way that the Kuffar can see him. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ said, this is a walk that Allah hates except in this situation.
So in some situations, when you need this, do it. But always feel inside that it all the success comes from Allah. Don't forget that. That's, uh, that's what we said before. Uh, 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 praising people, don't, don't praise each other. And the Prophet said, if you really have to praise someone, say, I think he is good and only Allah knows best. Okay? But between a husband and a wife, this is something this is called compliments and actually يعني, the Prophet even allowed uh, a lie to make a wife happy. Okay? And that's what we said before. We spoke about this last night. Yeah. Doesn't belong to you, yes, yes. Any zakah or sadaqa that you give, it's because Allah inspired you to give. I don't know. I, I, I mean that when you spend for the sake of Allah, don't be proud of yourself and say, see, I'm generous. I'm feeding all the poor people in the street. I am, excuse me, you're not feeding anyone. So don't exceed your limits. Always know that it's by the grace of Allah you are doing the good deeds. That's what I mean. Okay. Okay. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallah fikum. See you next time. Don't forget, ask advice from someone who is less fortunate than you and uh, list your shortcomings and fast one day during the week secretly. Assalamu alaikum.